<laughs> Why am I on here? Because you're awesome, and I wanted you on. <laughs> so, James, as we were transcribing, I did not know what the difference was between a... You were trying to practice. I think we need to speak a little bit louder, though, for the microphone. Okay, we can speak louder. Well, not that loud. This is being recorded. <laughs> Wait, I'm going to post all oh, of this. <laughs> I'm posting all of this. <laughs> I'm posting all of this, Karen, this entire conversation. <laughs> Why is this happening? <laughs> so, guys, thanks for tuning in to the College Alternative Podcast. I am the wife. <laughs> this is Karen. Thanks, Karen, for introducing yourself so well there. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but we're excited um, to talk about the topic of programming, computer science, computer engineering, uh, software engineering, whatever you want to call it there. And so today we're going to be um, have the honor of interviewing Richard Shaw. Why are you making this so weird? <laughs> First of all, you didn't introduce yourself. That's where I was going to be like, and this is, but then you kept this talking. This is all going to go into the intro. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was trying to think about what my line was. This is horrible. I'm, I'm like, all, you're going to be the weird one. Like, hey, guys, how's it going? This is my wife. Hi, I'm the wife. <laughs> what, what, is my line, what is my line supposed to be? What am I saying we're talking about? <laughs> Karen, we're going to be talking about programming today, and we're really excited because we're going to be introducing Richard Shaw on the program, and he's going to be talking about programming, computer science, uh, software engineering, whatever you want to call it. It's going to be involving computers. And so the main three points that we're, we're going to be talking about with him today are how can you get, as parents, how can you get your children into programming at an early age, and what else, Karen? Karen? Just ask you about it. <laughs> okay. So I guess I'm taking over this intro. <laughs> Why are you even standing next to me? <laughs> We're also going to be talking That's about how to differentiate yourself um, as a programmer <laughs> without a degree. Um, do all employers look for computer science degrees or are there other methods to um, learn or get hired on as a programmer? And then the third thing is what are the best ways to learn how to become a programmer? Is it necessarily to um, go and learn for four years in computer science. And there are definitely various arguments for that. He's also going to talk about the best tool that you can use in order <laughs> to get hired. Oh, so you remembered one of the talking points. Well, that's great. So hopefully you guys enjoy the show. This is... <laughs> We should do all our intros like this from now on. So Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> Enjoy the episode, guys. Interviews with the best in their fields, teaching you how to excel in careers that don't require traditional college. You're listening to the College Alternative Podcast. Insider tips and advice straight from the experts. And now, here is your host, James Christian. All right. So, hey, Richard. It's really great to have you on today. Really, really excited to talk to with you. And the first question I really want to start out with is something at kind of like the macro level. And that question is... Um, is technology um, at its peak or um, is it cresting? You know where I'm talking about as far as technology development, et cetera. Or are we only seeing the beginning, the start of the revolution as far as, as technology is concerned and the opportunities that are there? The technology market is just growing uh, exponentially. It is just moving fast. And it is not slowing down. Uh, what I like to tell people is like, well, today someone invented or made a faster processor. Tomorrow, either he's going to make it faster or his competition is going to double that speed. It's, it's fast-paced. Uh, advancement of technology, even new ways of producing or even harnessing energy wouldn't be possible without it today. Um, technology is everywhere. It's almost a requirement now. Uh, 
I, I mean, how else to put this? Technology allowed the steam engine to exist, and technology allows for affordable solar panels to exist for everyday consumers. Uh, advancing technology paves the way for markets to follow. Nice. Okay, so it's not like we've come up with every single software tech idea out there, and there's nothing. Absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, uh, every day, uh, I could just go into work tomorrow, and I'll just browse like Twitter feed or something like that. And all of a sudden, something new shows up, some idea, a new way of doing something, something innovative will be there. Like, oh wow, that's pretty amazing. Or uh, Facebook, for example, you know, MySpace was around prior to that, but they made Facebook, which is a, a better MySpace. So as you can see, even though an idea may already be out there, someone can definitely make a better way of it, and it just keeps going and getting better. So. <laughs> nice. And so why, why has software, the software market, grown so much faster than, say, physical goods or any other market out there like energy or something like that? Well, the way technology, let's say just today, the way technology, it's, it's, it's accessible to everybody. Everyone has a way of gaining access to a computer, gaining access to online you know, software, whatnot, and then they can change it. They can take it in. They can make it their own. And all of a sudden, they made this great idea. Now they can move forward with it in a much more easier way than me going and starting a goods uh, convenience store and trying to do something with that. It's just a little bit more involved. Um, it's easier for me to pull down Visual Studio and make an app and all of a sudden, bam, I made something brand new in a matter of days where if I have to go make a new shampoo, it's a completely different story. So the technology, that whole market and from website apps to mobile, it doesn't matter, will in its own way stay above in a faster pace than physical products. Energy is still up there, but... Uh, there's a whole, that's a whole other story about what <laughs> controls that. So. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting too what you're talking about as far as accessibility is concerned. You know, it seems like younger generations, they know about apps, they, they have more of a background in that programming, and they get taught that or have access to education on that versus that shampoo idea. Who's teaching them how to develop shampoo, you know, and bring that to market? Right. So, not, I mean, unless you go research it left and right to find out what you can do to make a better shampoo, uh, there are a abundant amount of resources available for everyday technology, websites, mobile apps, uh, you know, robotics, you know, you name it. That information is just readily accessible, and it's easier for anyone just to connect to the internet and get that information. Um, not to say you can't learn about shampoo. <laughs> but you're going to have to go find the necessary products, you know, you're going to go figure out marketing, you know, all this, all of this crazy stuff. Whereas it's just much easier to get your idea quickly on a website and run with it. I mean, you can just do just about anything. If you can find a problem that can be solved with technology and you can solve it, that you're already, you got your foot in the door. So, yeah. Yeah. And now the conversation is going to evolve into, the shampoo. We're, we're totally not going to even talk about nah, no software more shampoo. engineering anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, so kind of, let's get into your background here a little bit. You were, you were former military. Which branch were you? I was in the Marines. Okay. And so what MOS did you get into initially? Initially, I signed up to be in avionics. Okay. Uh, 6300 for those who know what that is. Um, I was going to, I just wanted to get into electronics. Oh my goodness, I hear some background noise here. Um, <laughs> I was going to get solely into um, avionics with with just working on certain aircraft. I didn't know which aircraft I wanted to work on. It's just I wanted to get into it. And since I already had kind of like this history of working with computers, it seemed like a great transi transition for me from where I was prior to the military to getting into something I already have some you know know-how about. Um, and so my military career started like that. I went through school. I graduated uh, out of um, uh, avionics. Uh, it was here in uh, Pensacola where I did that on NES. Um, but some life changes in my career changed. My MOS actually went into something a bit different. I went from avionics to administrative clerk. I worked on processing Marines and their records all the time instead of working on aircrafts. <laughs> no, man. Yeah. So did you know, like, okay, so... 
couple questions here. So the first one is, did you know what MOS you wanted to get into right off the bat? Right off the bat? Absolutely not. I uh, was sat down in that recruiter's office and it was like a blank slate. I had no idea. And so how did you how did you figure it out? I mean, did you come in with the knowledge of I'm going to be getting out after a couple of years? What's going to provide me with the training afterwards? Or did you just some figure out something that sounded cool and just sort of went with it? I was actually much more scared about the unknown. I went in there not knowing a lot at all. And when I went in, uh, I went in there with my father. It, it was it was because of him, his his inspirations and all that have so he, bring me to the military, make something yourself, and you get to do what you like. Um, so I went in there like, well, I want to do something with computers. Okay. And so I told that to the recruiter, and you know, some time and discussion later, that's they eventually settled on. I was like, okay, well, we have avionics. Would you like to work in electronics on aircraft? I'm like, well, that's two things I like, so let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, and so did you feel as though a lot of the guys? Um, that you went through basic with, were they kind of the same way? They kind of just picked something that sounded interesting at, at the time, um, or did they have any more future plans beyond the military at all? Unfortunately, I don't remember a lot of the guys who started with me. Um, okay. There was one or two that were there with me in the very beginning. I remember one of his, his name was Pahe. I remember him. He, he wanted in. He knew what he wanted to do. He, he joined, he went to the recruiters and like, I want to go into avionics, just pick an aircraft. I want to do it. Um, and it, hard set, he was in it. Uh, some of the other guys, they were kind of up in the air. Um, you can actually go in, um, uh, with no MOS in mind and one will be randomly assigned to you based off your skill set, which uh -huh. is learned through basic training. Um, that's like Russian really roulette that. right there. <laughs> yeah, that's a, it's a, an interesting roulette. Um, I didn't really want that because they would actually weigh heavier on infantry. And during when I went in, um, infantry was a, a hot topic. Everyone was going into it or people were going into it that they didn't want to. So in order to uh, prevent that from happening, I, I needed to come up with something I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And But everyone else that I knew, they uh, it was like 50-50. 50, 50. 50 knew what they wanted to do, 50 didn't know, and military helped them out there. Mm -hmm. And so what kind of resources would you recommend uh, for guys to kind of enlighten themselves, so to speak, as far as what skill sets they should be getting to right off the bat? You know, should you just kind of talk with the recruiter and go off what he, what he's relying on you, or is there stuff online? Um, the easy way out is if you absolutely just do not know, but you want to be in a military career, yes, a recruiter will be able to help you out there. He'll probably dig out some things that you might be good at. Otherwise, if you have a hobby, if you have an interest or just a talent in any field, automotive, you know, laundry or something like that, you go to the recruiter and you tell them that. It's like, look, I, I like working on trucks. I like working on vehicles. They'll get you into, um, into some sort of MOS that deals with uh, automotive. Um, you like working on uh, uh, like radar. You're into flight. You're into drones. You're... You, if you are into something, just tell them and they'll help you out. However, if you want to know more about what the military has prior to you joining, there's, a, a, like for example, the Marine Corps has a great area, USMC.mil. You go type in what you're into and they'll show, it's like, yeah, the military actually has these MOSs and this is what they're all about. If you're interested, go hit a, you know, go talk to a recruiter, tell them the, about this MOS and then there you go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And does it give you a good uh, kind of a good understanding as far as that those radar systems um, will get will get you a certification that will lead to a job after you get out as well? Or as a matter of fact, do they provide realistic kind of job expectations after you get out? You know what? Actually, you'll be surprised about what is possible that when you go into the military, what you learn, what you gain out of the military is easily transferable into a civilian uh, job. Um, a lot more than back then. Uh, so if you went into radar, if you went into some sort of like advanced electronics, you'll likely find something equivalently advanced today in the civilian workforce. Um, computers is a big one. Every, every, everything is computers from military to private sector to civilian. And 
someone's going to need someone who works on websites, who knows how to make Macs and Windows talk to each other and be nice. You name it. So I wouldn't worry too much about what you do in the military in any branch and worry about when you get out, can I use that knowledge? You will nearly 100% always have that opportunity to use what you've learned there on the way out as well. Nice, nice. So kind of let's move on here. You got out, and then what did you do? How did you get um, an education? Did you get a job right afterwards? What happened? So uh, my story, I'll, I'll try to summarize real quick. So I'm actually going to move so it's not so loud in here. <laughs> I'm just walking. So what, what worked with me is when I got out, there was a interesting – there was an in, uh, interesting time, like a month situation where I actually didn't have a job. Uh, I, I got out of the Marine Corps and I came home and I was like, I need to find work. I need, I, I, I need income. But during that six month period, I think I blame myself for this. Um, I couldn't find anything suited in computers at the time. And it seemed so awkward. But I think I blame the job market and all other environmental things. But what ended up happening is that I did get a job six months later as an assistant driver for UPS. Really bizarre. Uh, computers, <laughs> electronics, assistant driver for UPS. Um, yeah. And, and, and I did that for a month. I just I needed income. But what really happened, and then I try to tell people this all the time, if you're really in, if you're struggling with a job, or I'm sorry, not struggling, struggling with unemployment and you need something to help you out, recruiter companies. Tech recruitment companies. There's like uh, Tech Systems, Landrum. Uh, I think Ace is one of them. You talk to them, get them your resume, and they'll go out and help you find somebody who is looking for your skill set. Well, that's exactly what I I didn't know about them immediately, but that's exactly what I did. I went with Landrum, and within like two weeks, I landed a job at my current job, Atograph. I actually started off as a tech support guy. And from there, fast forward nine years, now I'm in charge of like a quarter of the company. So that's that's what happened after I got out of the military. It was a little rocky road. And I think everyone will hit some rockiness. Um, could I have done better? Could I have avoided that six month like lapse? Absolutely. It helps to prepare while you're still in. You have all that time. You can prepare. So that's what I that's what I my advice to any people on their way out. Nice. So, but the big thing here is you didn't give up either. No, because you know? it could have turned south real quick if I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not only that, you went from did you did you plug in the computer? Did you turn on the computer? <laughs> to <laughs> running yes. a large portion of the company. That's awesome. So, yes. uh, you said software engineering. So, what is that? Um, and kind of what are your day to day duties as a software engineer? So it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I, it, I like to all preface with this. Um, every, everyone at my job wears multiple hats. No one has a very strict defined job that they don't deviate out of. And is that so, pretty much across the board with most tech companies where you're wearing multiple hats or you get really locked into a specific? It correlates with size. The smaller the company, okay. the more hats you got. And gotcha. we're, we're a small company. I, we're under 50 employees at the moment. But most of us do wear multiple hats. We have multiple jobs, um, and that's how it works. So me being a system and DevOps administrator uh, with like influences and in software engineering and all that, um, I do a lot of things, way too much to go over in like five podcasts. And so <laughs> I'll try to summarize it. Uh, I manage the company's IT department, and I lead a small team to assist me with that. Everything IT is included from internal networking, computer system management, uh, repair and setup. Um, there's also things like user identity and file and resource management, all the way down to replacing the laser mouse for a guy three months in a row. Um, <laughs> DevOps, which is also, um, it, comes, it encompasses software engineering. Um, DevOps stands for development operations. And the thing is to know about DevOps is that it isn't really a thing that's done or even managed. It's a paradigm, a methodology of how many things are done. I bring harmony between different departments, such as the hardware and software department, and their abilities to create products 
and interoperate with each other. It's it's a weird it's a weird kind of system. Um, additionally, I manage the way uh, our virtual products, like just software websites, whatnot, are built and deployed to our customers. Um, it's just, it's a, that's a very short summarized list of what I do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Real list is pretty absurd. So, <laughs> but I mean, you started out at the ground floor. You started out, I'm assuming, with the very basics of In co- coding. Export, I, I was right. I'm sorry. What was that? Just just the basics of learning how to code, right? And starting off with with the coding aspect, and then branching off into these kind of more specific areas. Yes, very specific. So initially, when I started off, let's just we'll just use Actigraph. When I started off within Actigraph, I had very little coding knowledge. Um, what I what I like to say is Actigraph fostered me to allow me to learn and branch out on my own, either in any means necessary to learn more about, you know, programming. And that meant websites, um, Microsoft, VBA.net, all these other languages, uh, I was able to learn on my own. And I taught myself, I would, at, at work, I would give myself 20% of the day uh, and just read tutorials, read online resources, trial and error, just try to make things work. And then I would come home, and if I got some spare time at home, I would do the same thing. I was just, I would make it a hobby. Learn. Yeah, you developed about programming. You, you made it, it a passion for yourself. Exactly, and super enjoyed doing that. Nice, nice. So you did this on your own. So yeah. do most tech companies require some sort of a, a certification, like an outside certification, to sort of check the box to? Say, hey, I've blessed this guy. He has knowledge in Java or, or whatever. Are they looking for that? Or can you just say, hey, I know how to code. Let me show you what I can do. And then they just kind of go off that. As a matter of fact, you'll find a lot of even smaller and bigger tech companies, they, they like to throw out the education card real quick. They're like, we're looking for someone who has X amount of years uh, experience but also have like a bachelor's degree in computer science or something like that. Additionally, what they do is they also like, they put a flip, they, they provide an ultimatum in there is like, or this many more years of experience with some certificates, mm-hmm. which is helpful because certificates are far easier to achieve than some of these multi-year degrees. You can get a, you can get a certificate in half a year if you try hard enough, but uh, it's, it's much more prominent nowadays where tech companies are looking for someone who has a certificate where they have proven their self in that ability um, in, in a very professional form. Having field experience and doing things on a side and just saying, yes, I, I know how to develop an application. Just trust me. Sometimes they don't actually just take that. They need something, you know, here's a piece of paper saying I did it. So mm-hmm. certificates are definitely helpful in that, that regard. And then obviously degrees can be helpful. But mm-hmm. it's not it's not always the in like if they say you have to have a certificate, well if you can prove to them otherwise, that'll work. I've done it. I personally am an example of someone who got into a tech company and moved up in said tech company without a college education. I have done that. And I've mm-hmm. done that proving myself in my work ethic, my output, and all about and everything everything encompassing in that. Mm-hmm. So would you recommend People just pick up books and kind of learn online and through YouTube, or you do? Would you recommend kind of these coding boot camps that that are kind of online and, and or that sort of thing? Or what what's kind of the best way to learn? The best way to learn, and and this is just from experience of myself, it's through trial and error, learn by doing. More of a hands-on approach. If you want to learn a particular language, uh, programming language, mind you, a little bit easier than learning Spanish, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> let's let's just use um, C Sharp as an example. That's a very mainstream language uh, used by many companies today to make various products. If you want to learn how to do C Sharp, there are infinite number of resources online for you to go out there and say, I'm a yeah. beginner on C Sharp. I want to learn some basics. You can you can search that in Google or whatever search engine you're uh, choosing, and you'll find readily available resources that are very accurate, and you can learn from very easily. Um, there are books out there, which books are a little bit harder to deal with because once they're published, 
something may have changed and now the book's slightly outdated. Yeah. Uh, college isn't for this all the time, but they're great as a hands-on resource. You want to go read up on just about any of these great facts. These books are great to have. Um, however, if you want to go the little bit less expensive route, I would go with online resources. So any any language, any language, you will likely find it online and you can learn a lot from it just by just reading on it. And then some of them even provide tutorials, examples, something you can download to your computer. that will help you set it up and you can just learn by breaking it. And so that's <laughs> that's how I would recommend doing it is just get, go out there, find it, pull it down, mess with it, read about it. And then all of a sudden you'll 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 master it in no time. Yeah. And you could be doing this at age 12, 14, if you really if wanted you, to. If you can read, you got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Start off young, learn it, and then you'll be young. ahead of the 30-year-olds and <laughs> trying to learn it. <laughs> oh, so quickly, too. <laughs> nice. And so you're also, you mentioned to me before, you're earning your associate's degree um, on top of this, you know, on top of all this. So yes. why have you done that? And then what have you learned from this degree that you didn't know before, and how has it helped you? So the, I, I'm, I'm weird about college. Um, I've, I've talked to many people about it. One time in my life, I'm like, no, I, college is just a very expensive adult daycare to, yes, you need college because companies look at that and they're like, you have the ability to take a task and get it done and, you know, begrudgingly go through the, the boring classes. You'll, you'll make it. So I have learned that the, with my current company, they they said if you get a college education, not only are you helping yourself, but we'll give you a raise. I'm like, oh well, can't go wrong with that. <laughs> we'll <laughs> so give you more money. <laughs> we'll give you more money. That's always an incentive. So when I really boil it down, I, I'm doing I'm doing this uh, associate's degree to betterment of myself to allow me to open more doors for myself in the future. Yes, my field experience has definitely gotten me far, and it's a it's a great, ability, great uh, bit of ammunition. So if I go step before another employer and say, "Yes, I have twelve plus years experience in developing websites," they're like, "Well, so what's your education like?" Well, I didn't do anything, and so they might they might look down upon that if they're really looking for someone who has great fundamentals about how to work with in their workforce. So. I'm doing a, uh, an associate's degree, one, more money, because you know, education does lend you more money, so always remember that. And two, it's a self-goal of mine. I've gotten over my crude self prior and said, I'm just going to, I'm going to get an education. I want to become smarter. I want to get, maybe I'll learn something. And and that was one of the other drivers. It's like, okay, I know how to go make a website, but maybe they'll show me something I just, I overlooked. Or maybe I'll learn something of why the way of something I've been doing forever now exists. And that is great knowledge to have. It's always good to learn from where you come from. And it's always like a big history thing. Mm -hmm. So, and so, you know, the follow up with that is, am I learning something from my associate's degree? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a little bit more, I'm learning more in the non-programming classes that I'm taking than I am in the programming ones. But I think that's to be expected because these are a lot of introduction classes you throw me into the uh, the undergraduate classes. That's a different story, um, but I haven't got that far yet. So, my current associate's degree is in computer programming analysis with emphasis in web design. I have gone through Java programming, VB.NET programming, C sharp programming, web design, web scripting, HTML, and a class in Microsoft Office. That was bizarre. <laughs> so, <laughs> in in these classes. They, they teach you a little bit more than just the, like what the, the class title says. They, they teach you how to work in teams. They teach you how to uh, present yourself, how to get things done. They give you a task. You're learning not only to do said task, but to get it done in a timely fashion. So you get all these this discipline from working in these classrooms. And so, yes, I'm getting that at work. But now I'm detached from work that I've been sucked into for nine years, and I'm doing it in a classroom setting with uh, varying talent around me. So it's a challenge, and I love challenges. So <laughs> Nice. But, but to be said, you can start out without that associate's degree. Yes. Right? It Gain is that very experience. It's and then, possible. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
I, I think that would be an interesting takeaway here. Get your foot in the door in the company and then kind of progress with the actual education or vice versa. Just kind of depends on what you want to do, huh? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, are there various languages that you need uh, to get depending on what you want to do? Let's say you want to develop that app game versus you want to get into website development. Are there? Do you need to learn C++ or do you need to learn Job? Uh, you know, how do you... How do you learn which one? How do you figure out which language to learn first? That's a great question. It re it does depend on what you're aiming for, like what the end goal. Are you going to just do website development? If you're just going to do work on websites, well, then you should probably learn C Sharp, PHP, a lot of HTML, JavaScript, um, maybe a little bit of Python. It just, okay, well, what about website development? Are you doing front end? Then HTML and JavaScript. If you're doing backend, well, C Sharp, PHP, any kind of scripting language like that, um, those are great for website development. Oh, what about, let's think a desktop application. Again, C Sharp, it's a very versatile language. Um, there's also C, <clears throat> excuse me, VB.net's a big one in there. So, and what about mobile apps, video games, if you're going to develop yeah. video games? Yeah, there's just so uh, much stuff. I mean, how it, do you kind of narrow it all down? How do you narrow it all down? Even even for the watches, you know, if you have embedded technology, uh, there's a specific language for that as well. Uh, even C Sharp has an embedded framework, so you can develop in a very common language for an embedded uh, device where there's no hard drive. It's just chips. So it is mind-boggling from the number of outputs that you can uh, that you can achieve through various languages. And as the as the days go by, as these months and years go by, it starts boiling down to nearly every language can work in various uh, situations. So you don't need just to learn one, you should probably learn a few. And most of them, again, you can find it all online. So, <laughs> Well, I mean, that kind of just segues off into the next, next question, which is, you know, you're rattling off, you know, the website development, the app development, the game and software development side. You know, how do you and then all the different languages that branch off from each one of those various, how do you even, it's almost like information overload. I mean, which one, I mean, how do you even make that decision, a proper decision as far as which area do I want to get into, much less which language or how do I want to start uh, specializing in? So it's, it's a, that's an interesting take on that. It's, um, it is difficult. It can be difficult. So I'm trying to think of a, a scenario where I was into this. I wanted to develop a back-end system that worked with both websites and desktop and mobile applications. This is a very versatile system. And I chose to use C Sharp, but it wasn't just programming in you know, Microsoft.net. It was a, a paradigm, a thought process and all that. It's, it's, very, it's very difficult. It's hard to explain what, what one person would do. And, and it's, it's more than that. You also have to work with other languages trying to work with your, you might develop a C sharp application, but then all of a sudden there's objective C for I, for Apple phones is trying to talk to your stuff. How do you, how do you make that work? Mm -hmm. Java. So Android phones, how do you make that work? You end up finding yourself learning one, two, three, four, five, so almost up to 10 different languages. And how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you work with that? Well, if you ask me what's what's the call to do such and such, I'm like, hmm, might be string this, that. But what I end up doing is I'll go look it up real quick. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. And then I'm good for a while. So do I retain everything about these different uh, languages? Not entirely, but it's easy for me to find these things and be re-exposed to it. Uh, so what I'm trying to say there is don't, don't feel like it's going to be super overwhelming if you want to go tackle one or two different things, but it requires you to know all these different languages. Languages have a lot of a lot in common how they do things. It's just what we call the syntax. So I might say to perform this, it's letter A, but in this language it's letter B. It's the same concept, just you just have to know the paradigm of what that's about. It it gets very complicated real quick. <laughs> <laughs> but don't don't but the big takeaway here is don't get overwhelmed. Don't get overwhelmed. <laughs> uh, things, every, it changes daily and it's, you have to, you have, you may have to play, um, you know, keep up with that, but 
if you understand the fundamentals of these different languages, you'll be fine. You will be. Nice. So I have a lot of friends and I know a lot of people in high school probably have a lot of friends that, that went into or had an interest in computer science that already knew the field, right? They are already, you know, making games or programming, right? Before they got their degree or went to boot camp. Is that going to give them a leg up on everybody else? Or let's say me who is trying to learn basics at, you know, a later age, Am I going to be at a disadvantage trying to, to learn all this stuff going through a boot camp or online experience, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So having knowledge prior to going into these things is always helpful. That, that's, I, I would say that's a given. <clears throat> but if you don't have knowledge and you're going into the classroom, if you're going into the field, you, you will, I wouldn't say you'll struggle. It'll be a, a harder uptake. Um, it definitely helps to have that knowledge. Um, if you go into a computer field, either computer science or software engineering with no experience, uh, you will be challenged and you will work hard. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying that with almost any field that you go in blind with, you'll, you know, you'll have to some, uh, go in and you'll have to work hard to remember the material and apply it. Uh, now, if you go, now, if you do a lot of self teaching, uh, what we're uh, trial by error, uh, learn by doing about the various subjects in the field of your choosing before attempting to make it official, like with a degree or certificate, um, that is definitely going to make it much easier to get through a much easier walk in the park. Um, having a basic understanding of the field will definitely make it easier to get past the foundation classes and make it easier for you to hit the ground running on those upper level, uh, tactics and all that stuff. So nice, nice. Okay. Quick segue here. I just wanted to ask you this because I just thought of it. You mentioned military and translating military experience to your job. How did you do that? What, what, what did you put on your resume or how would you recommend guys who get out to translate what they got, let's say infantry, et cetera, et cetera, to what employers are actually looking for? How did you figure that out? So I got lucky. So I'll, 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 I'll say what happened to me first and then how, you know, what we can do with that. So yeah. where I was in the military just uh, about a year before I got out, when my MOS changed to admin clerk or 0151 for you guys out there to know that, um, I, I sat in front of a computer all hours of the day. And at one point I was trying to learn how to automate things. And so that's when I started getting to do some things that I can start translating to the to civilian world is automating uh, processing of records, so and so forth. So when that day came where I was like, all right, now I'm on my way out. I had a, an, um, uh, a coworker, I would say, and an officer that worked with me and she helped me translate things that she knew I did into something that would make sense for a civilian workforce. I can't say in one sentence, all of these 15 different government acronyms that make sense to them, but no one in the real world, yeah, exactly. I can't do that. So what we do is we translate the, you know, the various things that we did into something that would make sense for civilians. So I worked on SRBs and transitioned them from, you know, all their page 13 and rewards and this, that, that, and this. It's more now it's, I process it, I process records on this scale to produce this output and cut down uh, work, you know, work time 30%. You, 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 it's a quanti it, you turn it into a quantifiable value, and so I put on my resume that I j I was in charge of this to do this. It made this kind of better output, and I did that in like four or five lines. And that's what employers are looking for. And yes, yeah. So don't don't fill it out with buzzwords. This is I'm not I'm no expert on filling out uh, resumes and whatnot, but don't fill it out with buzzwords. But put down what you did, and put some actionable results. Something that will stand out. They're like, oh wow, he cut down processing time by 50%, that's a good thing. Versus you saying, yes, I processed a uh, hundred different SRBs and that had this, that, and that, and this. They don't care about that. They care about, you know, what you started with, what you did, how it ended. So. Yeah. 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 I just wanted to throw that back into there because I thought of it and it was very, very important for guys to, you know, be able to translate government t military talk into civilian talk. There's, it's so <laughs> bad. Communication. You need a book of your own. You're like, SRB. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay. So let's say um, you're a parent. Let's say you're a parent, right? And you've got a child that's 
interested in um, learning to code, let's say he's a 12 year old, 14 year old, et cetera, et cetera. How can I, as a parent, support them in that endeavor? Oof, that there is a lot that can be done. Uh, there are many tools and materials out there today that can help children get interested in programming. Incidentally, a lot of children like that game Minecraft. Everyone knows Minecraft. It's an open world exploration and crafting type game. <clears throat> it's yeah, not so you, much you, you burn hours, hours of you your can, day. Oh my goodness, it's <laughs> it's bad. You, the sun comes up, you're playing all of a sudden, and it's like twelve o'clock at night. You don't understand what happened. I could have uh, done the, so much with my life. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this game opened up the eyes and minds of many people around the world and it's something that allows them to critically think about what they do and where, uh, where to go, um, but allowed normal players to create something within the game or some basic programming. There was a feature inside that game. They call it, I think it's called Redstone or something like that. It's, it's just a common uh, gateway where if I do this, this actually will happen. Well, if you start putting that together in a much larger scale – you inevitably start programming within the game by playing it normally. And it gets people have gone crazy with this. And so how can I help kids? Well, it's easy for them to pick up. And not only will they get to play the game normally, but they can also go in there and create, invent, do something in a very familiar environment. It's very easy for them to pick up. Uh, now, Minecraft doesn't go in there and tell you, yeah, if you want to make a calculator that does you know, linear algebra, no, they're not going to tell you how to do that. Um, but it does give you that kind of that starting point. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I would recommend for parents is try to find something that the kid is interested in, their children that are interested in, and see if you can relate that to programming in some way. So do they like games? Find something that allows them to take mundane tasks and automate it using programming routines uh they like robotics uh there are hundreds of open source circuit boards that allow the users to program them and witness the fruits of their labors um you know it, do they like designing things uh can they make like let's say they do like origami you can make you can find programs out there that teach you how to do that so it's 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 they're they're out there. The toys are out. I wouldn't say toys. The 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 applications, the methods of engaging children to partake in programming, they're out there. They're available. And mm -hmm. nine times out of ten, you'll find them at Barnes and Noble. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so you don't think they're gimmicky or anything like that. You think toys are toys that have a worthwhile application for for kids. You don't plop them down on the couch. Read this textbook. <laughs> you know. Um, it's, it, it's valuable in terms of time and money for the parents to go that route. There are a lot of toys and yes, they can be gimmicky. However, that's my opinion and that's how I see it now. But that's the thing. That's how I see it. But that's not how the budding programmer may see it. If a child wants to make the robot move or make those LEDs blink up and go into a crazy pattern, uh, that's all the toy really does. And, and then they have it there. That's they find that great. Uh, these toys make it very easy uh, for people to get interested in the technology, uh, to learn what they're capable of doing, and to open doors to better and more complicated things. Um, the journey teaches you about your destination. That's what I say about that. So Yeah, yeah. I was looking in Hobby Lobby the other day, and I was seeing like robotic arms that you could program, and mm -hmm. this is so cool. I could, I could play with this. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> And it, it may seem simple. It may seem gimmicky when you're there and you're like, you know, after I've done everything with this, I probably would never use it again. But that's not the point. It's they have provided it in a medium for you to experience and learn that. So to one person is a gimmick to you and another person is like mind blowing. They're like, I would love to make this do whatever I want. And so when they get to it and they, they get it working, they're getting it's like, now I want to do more. Bam. You have accomplished the mission. Now yeah. they're going to start getting, yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Not only go from the arm thing to, you know, the, the car programmed on track. Now we're towing yeah. RC, RC uh, quadcopters to, you know, submersibles to, and it seems like a lot of high schools, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like a high, lot of high schools you can get into some of these clubs or middle schools, you can get into some interesting tech or programming clubs. Um, you're you're absolutely right, and high schools, colleges, even some just 
off the wall organizations just nearby. <clears throat> they are trying to engage children into this technology. Um, they don't want them all just sticking to their phones and that's it. That's the extent of their technology uh, knowledge. No, they want to engage them. Let them know that there's more to it out there. High school is a great proponent because they have the best exposure to the kids. And so I think it's great that high schools do that. And I think they should continue to do that. When I was going through high school, that wasn't a thing. No, not, not for <clears> me <throat> either. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a thing. I had to do it on my own. And it was very difficult to engage others about that. I'm like, yes, I made this. Well, they're like, whatever. It, they do that already. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't that they do it already. It's like I did that. And so now high schools are grabbing these students up and putting them in these clubs to experience, to be innovative, to get out there and do something a little bit more than the curriculum has set. So I'm glad that they're doing that. Nice. Nice. Um, big, big question here. Um, what does it take to be a good coder? Ah, yes, that, that one's, that one's a good one. And <clears throat> so there are so many aspects that make a good programmer. Lots of websites and online communities talk about these aspects and qualities, and they build upon them. I personally think it's a, it's a combination of good work ethics, uh, a good attitude, and a solid drive for perfection, coupled with the willingness to learn more every day and having great technical skills. That, that was a plus. <clears throat> and um, actually, I have a couple things. It's uh, great to uh, be a great problem solver, so critically think on that. And lastly, able to work well with others. You have to be able to work in a, uh, a team environment. It's having those basic qualities provide a solid foundation in my book of being a great programming or uh, programmer. Sorry, um, in any environment, it's not so much about the technical skill set. Where can you write a good program? It's also more about can you work in an environment? Can you take the hardest project and perfect it? Can you do all these various things? in a working environment and be good at that instead of just see how fast you can type on a keyboard to output that product. Mm -hmm. It's all about, <clears throat> you know, it's all about precision, accuracy, and reliability. If, if you, if you're rushing products out the door all the time and there are bugs after bugs after bugs, that doesn't necessarily make you a good programmer. So, yeah, well, I think it's kind of interesting. It's not just, I like that you said, it's not just about the coding. It's about all this other aspects. You know, it's not just a one-dimensional thing that you've got to be working on. And, yes. You know, that, that team. You're not just sitting in a basement somewhere in the dark, you know, <laughs> you know, like sucking down Mountain Dews doing your thing. You know, you've got to be – it's not like that, right? You've got to be in a team That's environment and, and communicate. Now, it, you do – like sometimes you can work solo. And it's – it. <clears throat> you don't want to be the, uh, the cowboy coder. You don't want to be that guy who just – does everything solo, you're a star programmer, you, you're an army of one. That doesn't make you a good programmer. Just because you got that product out the door, the moment you're paired up with a person to work together, you may falter, you may fold. Mm. You have to maintain good work ethics, uh, a process from getting requirements for the product and then working solely on said requirements. It's all about the process. It, people can type on a keyboard all day long. It's it, it doesn't, it's not about the code. It's about <laughs> process. Yeah. If you're, if you're an a-hole, no one's going to want to work with you. And <laughs> Oh my goodness. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. I like that. I like your explanation there. It's, 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 you have to be well-rounded in order to be a good coder. Yes. And that's good. So just not just, don't just work on one aspect of your professional development, work on, work on everything too. Work on everything. And that's actually helped you too, which is you, you provide that communication between the hardware and the software teams, right? I've uh, worked so, so well, apparently they put me in a position to actually foster additional <laughs> communication. So, Hey guys, let's all sit down and talk, talk about pretty this. much. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. Okay. So, um, you get the coding, you get all that stuff down, you become comfortable with that, you start, you know, learning, learning all those informations, you get the certifications. How do I find a job? You know, where do I go? How do I find a job? Are all the jobs out in, you know, Palo Alto, you know, and out near Stanford, where it's Silicon Valley? Where are the jobs and how do I find them? The, the, that's the next hurdle. So yes. now you got the technical skills. Now you need to, now you need to get money for it. Yes. So, 
people can find jobs, <clears throat> excuse me, in programming best with online services such as, te- like I mentioned before, technical recruiting companies. Um, I didn't get the chance to use one of these services until much later, but I met people who have. Okay. And so these companies specialize in identifying the needs of com- of other companies that need technically inclined people to work with tech side, or if you finally got these technical and you're looking for that job, um, look for technical recruiters online and start there. You'll be amazed how easy it can be to uh, get a job once they know your skill set. Um, now, let's say you're in the middle of, um, I don't know, North Dakota, and you need, and you need, you have like, yo, I want to do programming and whatnot, but I'm in this like, 1500 person population town and the nearest city is like four hours away. How do you deal with that? Well, you're going to have to start making some life decisions there if you need to move. However, it's not always the end. A lot of companies do remote work. So start branching out, looking for companies in other, excuse me, in other areas and see if they'll do remote work for you. So most of technology today, telecommunicating is very easy. They want you to work on a website. Well, you don't have to be in their office to work on said website. You can be at home doing it. Um, so technical recruiters are the best first step in that. You may try to go do it on your own, but it's like defending yourself in court. You need that lawyer. You want to go out there in the job market, get a get a technical recruiter on your side to help you out. Okay. That's really interesting. So technical recruiter is kind of the way to go for you. Not mm-hmm. just sort of throwing your resume out to every kind of random company out you there. You can go to, what is it, like monster.com and all these other places. You yeah. can put your resume out there. I mean, if it's free and it gets your resume out there, do it. Not saying you shouldn't. You should totally try. But if you want to get that leg up and someone who specializes in looking for jobs like that, tech recruiters are your good uh, good call. Nice. And do you have to pay them to to push your resume uh, out? Or as do a matter companies of fact, employ them? Uh, as a matter of fact, no. In my experience, and from what I've talked to you, as the re, you know the re, the um, potential employee for other people, you don't pay. Uh, when you get contracted out to another company that technically hires you, that company pays for you then. And then if they can buy out your contract to fully hire you or whatever the case may be, that's when all that happens. But do you pay anything? Nope. Nice. That's free. Nice. I like that. Free. <laughs> so. You're saying, and this is everything, like, oh, you know, the apex is to work at Google. You know, and that just seems to be kind of the, you know, the, the default is you learn coding, you want to work at Google because all the perks and you get paid really good, and blah, 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 blah. Is that kind of what success is for a coder? I mean, is that kind of where the best opportunities are out there? I, I, or can think, you find every, I think every developer programmer would aspire to work at a place like Google. But don't think Google being your end goal. Think bigger, think better. You always want to, you should always strive for, you know, betterness of yourself and perfection. Just because Google is this massive company and they have all these great technologies that they output, doesn't necessarily mean it would be great to work for them either. <clears throat> um, so I've done my research on Google before. Would I ever want to work at Google? Actually, no, I don't. I would rather work for a smaller company that is a little bit more agile, a little bit more open to innovation versus working for such a massive company where they're like, okay, we need you to, in red, do that perfectly. You can't do anything else. What is Google doing that? Probably not. But such a company like that, they take care of their, uh, their employees, but you're working on very, very concise projects over there. And not a lot of room for innovation, not a lot of room to stretch your legs and start doing something more. Uh, you have to do that on your own time. and You can't do that on the company time. Whereas smaller companies, you bring an idea to the table that's completely like off kilter to their direction. And they're like, wow, that's great. Let's try that out. You won't get too much of that without like, you know, what is it? Uh, management by committee or something like that. Something crazy. <clears throat> but, um, but just depends on what you want. Yeah. It depends on what you want. Yeah. So is Google that gold standard? I wouldn't say they're a gold standard, but they are something that if, if you want to work for Google, yeah, absolutely. Um, website design applications, you name it, they've done a lot and they are very successful. If you land a job at Google, I'm, I'll be happy for you. I hope you're happy with, with what you do in there because 
get it done. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but there's so many other companies out there, so many other smaller tech companies, almost almost like indie gamer kind of things that you'll have just as much fun and success in. So, don't just pigeon pigeonhole yourself into what you preconceive is it your success, right? Right. Don't put was it? Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't think Google's your only basket. Don't don't try to shoot yeah. among the stars to land in Google. No, shoot past the stars, past the Milky Way galaxy until you get to somewhere where you're sitting there. You're like, I'm the CEO. I'm doing my own thing now. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Always yeah. more. Yeah, I was interesting. That really resonates me with me what you're talking about as far as innovation is concerned. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was a conversation between a recorded conversation between Peter Tell, creator of Face okay. or Pay, PayPal, and uh, I think Airbnb, one of the founders of Airbnb, and they're talking about how they were able to recruit programmers to their startups versus just go off and work at Google. And they were saying. The way you recruit people is to say, hey, we are an innovative small company where you can be innovative. You can wear multiple hats. You can work on side projects and constantly be elevating everything. And you'll be amazed how many developers would love to hear that. They want to be able to try new things. They want to be able to see a new technology emerge and use it, make something of it. Uh, but when you start putting a cap and restricting developers, they turn into what we call code monkeys, and they're they're not having too much fun. So <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, so how can you set your how can you set yourself apart as an applicant? So that can be definitely a tough endeavor. Um, if you really want to shine and stand out in the crowd <clears throat> of the ever growing pool of developers out there, you really need to be engaged in the development community. Learn how to manage a project. Um, understand and demonstrate a the product's creation life cycle and explain that to people. Be able to communicate and talk to them. Present yourself in that manner. And understand the different platforms that support applications uh, that are created. So if you create a website, does it work on an iOS phone and an Android phone, also on this laptop or this? You need to be able to know a lot about that. Having that knowledge is greatly beneficial. And so... And what and the last thing is to work and communicate with others in a team environment. If you can demonstrate that on paper, uh, you'll definitely have a leg up in there. Generally, being a distinguished developer has very little to do. And I mentioned this before about the abilities to program. I would say being able to program is the minimum requirement and having <clears throat> having solid work ethics, communication skills, team skills and overall determination will definitely stand you out of the crowd. Mm-hmm. Being able to get from point A to point B successfully. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's it's like like I mentioned before. It's more it's more than just you writing a program or writing fifteen programs. How did you write those fifteen programs and their success? Like did did you do it within the deadlines? You know how accurate were you? You put it out there. Were there any bugs? Translating that onto a resume would be a di- bit more difficult. But once they start learning more about you and they ask you these very specific questions during like interviews and whatnot, if you can demonstrate and you know, provide proof of these accomplishments more than your just ability to code, you'll definitely stand out to them. And trust me, at my current job, we're interviewing developers left and right, as a matter of fact. And we have some people where it's like buzzword friendly resumes. And yeah, I've developed a website and I did that, that and this, but they work by themselves. They have no means of working in a team environment where they have to work either with just one other person or 15 other individuals, you need to be able to demonstrate that you can do that. And if you do that well, you got it. Yeah. And you can start banging that stuff out in high school too. Absolutely. Right. I developed Mm -hmm. a mobile app. Mm -hmm. It was to this many subscribers. I done bugs. I contract subcontracted out to somebody in Croatia or whatever, you know, I, you know, I was able to, yeah. So, The first thing I mentioned was the uh, be engaged in the developer community. That really is contributing to open source projects, stuff that you may not even have created or ever worked on before. So if you go out to GitHub, which is a really big place for open source projects, and you start pulling down these projects that you probably have no idea what it is, but you think you can be helped, you know, either interest you and you want to help them make it better, or you found a problem and you fixed it, but now you're providing back to the community. Now more people are gonna benefit from your fix. 
So what you do is you you give it back out there. You talk to the guy who created it. And you're like, hey, this is what I found. This is how I fixed it. <clears throat> and you write that all up and bam, you just contributed. And now people are going to read that and they're going to start realizing that you're helpful or realizing that you can work in this manner. And if you just do that across the board from all these various open source projects all over the uh, community, you'll you'll benefit greatly from that. And people will see that and they'll find it. So nice. And so that's how you set yourself apart. That's what you yes. can refer to as an applicant. That's awesome. Yep. OK. And is that the best? Kind of trying to link this in with kind of the last question here. The best way to, to demonstrate to employers that you know what you're doing is to refer back to these projects that you've been working on. Yes, side projects and community connections. <clears throat> Think of it this way. If you created and or contributed to various open source projects online, you've likely worked with others and contributed your time and code to the betterment of the product. You, uh, you start to establish an online presence then. Uh, that kind of establishment can be found by an interviewer uh, if they research you online. And uh, they will do that, right? They, they will, will do that. They absolutely will do that. I've done it for uh, hiring IT officials. So uh, technical recruiters also use that kind of information and form it into an actual point for potential employers for you. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, the best way to demonstrate your talent for employers, do some side projects of your own and or contribute to the online community. Nice. It's it's you can't go wrong there. <laughs> and I guess the final question here is um, what do you like best about being you know working in the tech industry? What what is what has been a reward for you working there? Every day is a challenge and I love challenges. Uh, I love being innovative. I like take when someone presents me with a problem and they're like just solve it. Of course, you know, we are like, well, can you tell me more? But I, I like to take that and be innovative with it. I like to come up with a solution, either simple or overly complex where no one else can figure it out. It's, I like working with that. I love development. I love programming because I can tell the computer what to do and then immediately hit F5 and then see the fruits of my labors. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It feels great. I'm, I worked all week on this project and I, I like, all right, here it goes. And you run it and it goes to this entire super complex that it looks like a window to everyone else. But you know, in your mind, that's 50,000 lines of code all executing <laughs> harmony and out pops out this result and it's green across the board. And you're like, yeah, I did that. <laughs> it, it feels great. No mistakes. So, yeah. No mistakes. Like, Oh my goodness. Woo, it did not crash. Um, it's, I wouldn't want to go in any other field and being an IT professional and a DevOps manager and a system admin and a software developer, I get the best of all the worlds from working on the computer to telling it what to do. Um, it's just an amazing feeling and computers are where it is. Uh, there's other, there's other products out there that, you know, are going to, are working well at the time, but computers are always going to be there. Information technology. You, if you're, if you're in that, you're golden. It's not going anywhere. We're not going to go back to the Stone Age anytime soon. It's just, you got that. If you can get in there, learn tricks of the trade there. And that's what I did. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, Richard, thanks for sitting down, taking the time, talking. It's very, very interesting seeing your life story and kind of how, you know, you went from military to, to programming and made that your passion and were able to make that transition. and. That's great. It's really, really wonderful to kind of hear your story and, and put your advice out there to everybody. So thank you. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. And you, you have a good one, okay? All right. You too. Take care. <laughs> See, I, the nice thing is that with, with recording now, we can just capture our hilarious moments. Well, no one's going to watch the ending anyway. <laughs> so, be like, okay, we got it. Why bother watching this? So for all you guys out there that did decide to watch the outro, if you do have any comments, questions, concerns, please go down below, comment down below. Both Karen and I will, will track down um, some more interesting people, any, any, uh, any of those occupations that you suggest. Um, yeah, we'll get we, on that. We do get excited when there are comments, you know, like, hey, someone watched. So <laughs> that's evidence. <laughs> yeah. So, we'll, you know, we'll follow up and, and we'll track down who you who do you want to get interviewed next? And yeah, 
So until next time, guys. Bye.